that title for future. Uh, and we will move to the CSIRO, if those officials could move forward. Let me think about it. Jared has. Do you want to start with Jared? Yep. Jared, are you happy to go? Yep, sure. All right, welcome. Did you have any opening remarks? Uh, Dr. Larry Marshall, Chief Executive, CSIRO. Um, I did chair, but I thought in the essence of time I'd table them, if that's Thank all right. I, we really do appreciate that. Um, we always like to get people home to their families and loved ones as quickly as we can. So, uh, Senator Rennick. Hi, guys. How are you going? Uh, look, uh, given that heat's kinetic energy, the energy of motion, is it fair to say that CO2 traps heat, um, or is it fair to say that climate change theory invalidates the Stefan Boltzmann law that radiation, that says radiation is emitted in all directions? Um, Senator, are we sticking with classical physics, or did you classical. want to go to quantum as well? Yeah, no, classical. Oh, classical. So, uh, yes, Senator, so in, in classical physics, um, uh, gases like CO2 and water itself in the atmosphere um, absorb energy from the sun yeah. um, and they heat the uh, surface of the earth. Sure. Um, from memory, um, and it's a few years since high school, uh, since uh, uni physics, but from memory the yeah. earth is about 16 degrees hotter as a result of all of the gases in the atmosphere. Okay, and that's, that's been why good I asked for that question, so I, question I noticed last time and I, I was told that was a hypothetical that couldn't be answered. Yeah. Just from a Just point of view of enough. optical physics, that's yeah. the heat <clears throat> exchange, Senator. Yeah. yeah. So it also radiates though too, doesn't it? It doesn't just absorb, it radiates? Uh, it depends, but it, it depends, Senator. Sometimes, well, or yes. conduction. So it loses it either via conduction or radiation or convection, yeah, three forms of heat transfer. Yep. So, so generally speaking, the atmosphere is kind of like a protective blanket around the earth that, yep. that, that holds the heat in. And that's what yep. made us all a bit warmer than we otherwise would be without yes, the atmosphere. Yes, that's true. Yep. But, but it's also, you've also got convection, don't you? Where of course, so rises. the air currents circulate and the heat moves yeah. around and the... Yeah. But, but so just, just so we're clear though, that heat does radiate as well as absorb. Yes, Senator, and that's also, this is where you're talking about the Boltzmann yeah. Uh, yeah. constant. Yeah. So that's correct, it does radiate heat as well? Yes, Senator. Yeah. And uh, where does radiation and heat come from, the energy from radiation come from in the first instance? Well, when light impinges on a surface, yeah. and, it, and it, that's why I asked about whether it's classical or quantum. So if the sunlight hits a surface of an object, um, it'll, yeah. it'll either be reflected or okay, absorbed. Okay, yeah, I understand that. I said, where does it come from initially? Um, the absorption of a photon of energy. So this is the quantum thing. So uh, the creation of energy, where because, does it happen? I'll give you a clue. Where does it happen in the solar system? It's all, it's oh, in the sun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which is really that's hydrogen right. energy. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, so the energy initially comes from the fusion of hydrogen and helium, as per E equals mc squared. Exactly. Yep. Thank you. Um, so, is it therefore uh, fair to say that uh, the amount of energy in the atmosphere is first and foremost determined by the output of the sun? The amount of energy in the in atmosphere. In the first instance. Well, Sen Senator, Senator, it's Senator Rennick, look, I, I'll allow you to go a little bit, but yeah. I mean, this is estimates, hearings. It's sure. about the expenditure of public funds. Exactly, and we're spending, so, yeah, we're no, spending a lot of money here but on theories that need to be it's, tested it's, on it's, science. It's not, I, I do not believe the estimates hearings are yep. a discussion forum for scientific thought. Yep. We've really got to get to something that's related to the expenditure of public funds. Well, um, you know, um, I'll, I'll give chair. you some, I'll, Senator Rennick, yep, I'll give I'm you some there. latitude, yep. but we do need to get somewhere close to the expenditure sure. of public funds. <laughs> sure, I, I am getting there. Okay. Because, yeah. okay. So, um, <clears throat> so is it fair to say then that CO2, when it absorbs heat, uh, it's got four vibrational frequencies, 2.8, 4.3, and two degenerate modes at around 15 microns. And 
according to Wine's law, that the major peak radiation around that level uh, would be about 192 degrees Kelvin, or minus 80 degrees for radiation. I'm not talking about conduction or convection here. So, Senator, in, in general, um, molecules like CO2 tend to absorb more in the infrared than they do in the visible or yep, the ultraviolet? Yes, that's what I've just and, said. And that's what yep. you're saying, yep. yes? Yeah. Yeah, so, but, you know, there's also, when they absorb at the infrared, they, they generally have a peak emissivity at a certain temperature, according to Wine's law. Are you familiar with that? Uh, yes, Senator. Yeah. Okay. So, just wanted to clarify that, because where that emits up at the top of the atmosphere, so mi minus 80 degrees is a long way up in the atmosphere. Yep. you bit. Okay, it's fine. You don't have to answer it. That don't have to, have, have to answer it. Okay, so, I guess... Um, where, where I'm getting to is effectively we have three forms of heat transfer, radiation, convection, conduction. The main form of heat transfer in the atmosphere one, after radiation comes down and heats the earth is convection. Yep. Uh, well, you have a bit of both, actually, Senator, yep. and because the, the air moves and it yep. can transfer through the physical movement of the air molecules or through re-radiation of the, of the light. Yep. And that's the quantum part of the effect where a photon is absorbed yep. and then it can be re-emitted sometimes at a different wavelength. Sure, yeah. But, but I guess my point is radiation heat, convection will cool. So you've got evaporative cooling, you've got thermal currents, you have clouds. You have a number of mechanisms that will cool the atmosphere as well as heat the atmosphere. So you have a flow of heat in and a flow of heat out. Yeah, that's right. And, and the second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy of the system will increase. So effectively, you know, if you've got a three, lower atmosphere with three, say it gets three degrees hotter, as per one of the IPPC forecasts, then in theory, if you assume that, you know, use the first law of thermodynamics, that the energy of the system, overall system won't change, it would have to be three degrees cooler in the, high, in the higher part of the atmosphere, then surely if you apply the second law of thermodynamics, that, that basically the atmosphere is eventually going to even out in terms of temperature, won't it? Because hot air does rise. So, Senator, if I follow your logic, so, so what do we know? Um, we know that over um, a very long period of time, um, yep. the, the temperature of the Earth has increased a little bit, about yep. 16 degrees, as a result of yep. um, the absorption of yep. uh, radiation in the atmosphere yep. um, by everything, CO2, water vapour, the whole nine yards, our breath. Um, and, and that's an equilibrium situation. Um, and then we know that if we change that equilibrium, if we put something else in the atmosphere that in increases the absorption, then we'll see a continued increase in temperature. Yep, totally agree with that. Because no we problem. know we've seen it before. Yep, um, no dramas. But the question is, so yeah, greenhouse gases make up about 5% of the atmosphere. You've got nitrogen and oxygen, which makes up the other 95%. But they also play a role in convection. So when you say there's a blanket around the Earth, I think that's a mis... Uh, a, a poor characterisation because, you know, I would describe it as if you're sitting in a car with the windows wound up, you're locking out your convection, right? But the reality is, in a greenhouse you mightn't have convection, but in the atmosphere you do. So if you wind those windows down or you come home in the evening and your, your house is hot and you open up the windows, the wind will blow in and convection will often even out the temperature, not perfectly, but, you know, so you've got similar. So I guess my point is, is that many of these models underestimate the impact of convection, don't they? But remember, it's a closed system, Senator. So if I use your analogy of the car, we'd have yep. to vent atmosphere into space yep. in order to get that, that change of mass. Sure. Because energy mass equivalence, again, quantum theory. Yep. Um, but we don't do that. The, the atmosphere is pretty much trapped, and that's kind of why you have the greenhouse effect. Uh, but we have hydrogen in that escape into the exosphere and things like that. And I'd also argue that at, at, at the equator, you've got yeah, your troposphere is, what, 16 kilometres High, whereas at the poles it's 10 kilometres high, so that hotter air does expand and pushes out anyway, right? So the idea that it's a confined space, because heat's basically a function of volume, okay, I can also argue with that because the equator has a higher higher um, point of the troposphere, and, the, and I would argue the proof of that is in your dry adiabatic lapse rate, whereby it's the same at the equator as it is at the poles, despite the fact there's much higher concentration of CO2 okay. at, at the equator. Right. What's the hell at the moon? Can you do it on someone Senator, else's time? Let's, Look, let's, you've given him a warning. This is ridiculous. This is just ridiculous. No, no, this is very important. Be, no, no, hang on, we're spending let's over $20 billion try to be in subsidies for renewables. So let's just try to be respectful. I'm almost there. However, yeah. Senator Rennick, we, yeah. we have got nowhere near the expenditure of public funds as sure. yet. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Okay. So, Senator, I'd, I'd be worried if we were expending much atmosphere 
if we were venting much atmosphere into space, because that wouldn't be a very sustainable situation. So I yeah. don't know that there can be a significant well, no, mass molecules transfer. Go into space. Yeah. yeah, I'm not saying the atmosphere goes into space. But anyway, so let's get to the cost gen report, right? So basically, your guys have come up with a discussion paper on cost gen. They've made a number of assumptions. One of them is that coal powered fire stations last for 30 years. Now, we've got one at Gladstone, which is, you know, been around since 1976 or 78, so it's 42 years going on to 50. Why is it that the CSIRO has assumed that coal-powered fire stations only last for 30 years when it's well known that, you know, they last for over 50 years? I know that power station. That's the one that powers the smelter at Boyne Island. That's isn't exactly it? right. I yep. know that one well, yeah. Um, Senator, I'll, I'll let uh, Dr Mayfield um, answer that, but... Yep. When I read the GenCost report, I guess what I read was a little bit different, and yep. that the, the coal-fired power stations that Australia already has will, will naturally be retired, regardless of anything else, regardless of yep. any policy, will, will naturally be retired for economic reasons by about 2040, just as yep. they reach the, the end, of, end of life. Yep. So the question we were trying to answer after talking to the um, power companies was, if that's true, um, what will you build? What will you build next? What do you yep. need to build now so that Australians can um, get a lower cost of electricity in the future than than we have now? Yep. And that was really the purpose of that. But I'll right. let Dr. Mayfield. Um, yep. uh, Senator, so Peter Mayfield, uh, Executive Director for Environment and Energy Resources. Sure. Um, so I think, as per our conversation we had back in February um, with Paul Graham and myself. Yep. Um, with respect to the, the power stations life, so they definitely have a technical uh, life of 50 years yep. and possibly longer. The context of the work that was being done is looking at uh, what was the economic pathways forward for a range of different technologies for AEMO. Yep. And the work looked at what was the economic life of the, of the plant as yep. well, given the changing conditions in the national system. And that's where the 30 years comes from, uh, given the different financing ar arrangements that are required. Well, that's interesting because the Finkel report said Cogan Creek, for example, only cost $9 a megawatt for operational costs. I mean, that's a mine mouth coal mine uh, power station that's owned by the Queensland people, so it's not subject to market forces or anything like that. There's 400 million tonnes of coal there. The Brownfield site with the second pad already built, I find it difficult to believe that you could assume that that was going to cost $2.80 a gigawatt, um, a gigajoule, sorry. Um, uh, so I, I do dispute your assumptions there, but I'll just I'll just finish off with uh, uh, one other question. Uh, the um, sorry, I'll just get the points here. So uh, Professor, Professor Richard Harrington, uh, head of Earth Sciences from the Natural History Museum of, of London, has said for the for the UK to meet its UK electric car targets of 2050, they would need to produce just under two times the total of annual world cobalt production, nearly the entire world production of neodymium three quarters of the world lithium production and at least half of the world's copper production. Now that's a hell of a lot of energy that's going to be required for batteries that might last more than a decade for just one country, isn't it? Yeah, and we're worried about batteries too, Senator, because they, they're, they cost about three times more to recycle the lithium batteries than yep. the actual value of the, of the material. So we're very worried about that. It's kind of one of the reasons we leaned hard on hydrogen, because we think hydrogen yep. is actually a very attractive energy storage mechanism, and actually Australia could control that and actually build it here, rather than relying on rare earth metals that are um, coming from China or other countries. Yeah, and lithium's a 1% ore body as well. Did you know that? So you've got to mine 100 tonnes of it just to get one... Yeah, and it's a yeah. very environmentally unfriendly material to, to process, which is why we don't really process it here in this country. But yeah. if we could and make do it cleanly, that'd be another interesting option for Australia. Sure. Just in general, I think we need to add more value to our raw materials here. Oh, totally, great. Yeah. We'll get more value, more jobs yeah. here. Yeah. OK, then. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Senator. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. We did get to some very good questions in the end. Um, Senator, um, what? Senator Chisholm? Yeah. Chisholm. Thanks, Chair. Um, I understand uh, the CSIRO executive recently completed an annual performance and investment review process. Can you outline what was involved in the process? Sure, Senator. So we do this every year. Um, we look at uh, the portfolio of our investments um, and the objectives um, that we're aiming for in each part of the organisation. And we do kind of a future survey of where we think Australia is going to have challenges or opportunities going forward into the future. 
and then we shift the shape of our portfolio so that we position to be in a better place um, if those things happen in the future. So to give you an example, um, four years ago we uh, increased our investment or our focus on um, uh, dealing with uh, pandemics um, and uh, diseases. We beefed up our ability, to, for example, to scale up uh, vaccines using a biologics manufacturing line that we built at Clayton. We beefed up our um, uh, PC4 lab, which is one of only uh, five or six in the world, so that if we did have a pandemic, and really we weren't thinking pandemic, we were thinking, you know, white spot prawn, um, African swine flu, something, white spot prawn disease, one, one of these things that comes in from the food that we import that might be a risk to livestock or people. We beefed up our ability to deal with that. And, for, and fortunately we did, because then when COVID happened, we were really on the front foot to deal with it. So APES is all about what could happen in the future in Australia, where, where, where might market shift, and what science and technology do Australian uh, industry need to be better positioned to deal with that. Another big shift we made was in artificial intelligence, which is paying off now in our um, uh, predictive models for bushfires and bushfire um, control. Okay. So there wasn't anything significant in this review, it was just a standard review that you do each year? Yeah, we do it. We do it every year, just to make sure that we're we're sort of aiming at the right at the right things. So, I'll give you an example. We launched a program of um, missions um, during the year. These are where we try to really solve a really specific problem, um, like hydrogen production um, or critical energy metals. And so we, we shifted resources to focus more specifically on those problems. So that's one area. Advanced manufacturing or agile manufacturing is an area where we increased our investment because we learned during the pandemic that if we could help factories shift from what they normally make to make a, like a personal safety equipment, you know, surgical masks that we couldn't buy in from overseas during the pandemic, if we could figure out how to do that more easily, then we'd give Australian companies an unfair advantage where they could shift their product mix based on changes in the market. So we invested more in, in that area. These are sort of the examples we're trying to really be specific about what science we do to help industry. Yeah. Uh, I understand as a result of this review, all areas of CSIRO have now been allocated indicative funding for the next four years? Been allocated? Indicative funding for the next four years? We do, we do plan a four-year budget, but that has to be approved by our board, so that hasn't happened yet. But we've done, the, we've done our math, if you like, on that. Okay. Um, could you detail which areas have been have received additional funding to grow? Uh, basically, our missions program, which covers most areas of CSIRO, um, I probably could go through those, but essentially areas where Australian industry um, has or needs an advantage, so agriculture and food, um, uh, energy, um, minerals, um, advanced manufacturing, um, what we call future industries, which is um, particularly digital um, or advanced manufacturing, and then of course health, and then aspects of uh, national security, so cyber security, for example, um, or protecting Australia better from uh, cyber threats and um, uh, biological threats. So they generally fall into those six sort of okay. national challenge areas. Um, and I presume that some areas have suffered reduced levels of funding as a result. Yeah, it's hard. Well, our, our budget envelope has actually grown, um, but where we put our priority does shift. What we've noticed, Senator, in science, in, in innovation, though, it, it no longer happens in, in individual parts of the organisation. It happens kind of at the intersection. So, for example, we have a business unit called manufacturing, but manufacturing is done there. It's done in our digital business unit, Data61. It's done in agriculture and food. It's done in minerals. And so that overall, if you like, portfolio of manufacturing um, is actually probably grown a little bit. Mm. So... Just to pin you down on this, so there have been some areas that have suffered. I'm just trying to get a sense. Like you gave me a sense oh. of where you're spending more money. Yeah. I suppose what's 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 considered so less of a We haven't enacted those changes yet, Senator. Though this is just 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 planning. But but I'm I'm not quite sure how to answer your question. Maybe you could ask me again. Well, <laughs> you said which areas you focus on and have received additional money. So I'm just trying to get a sense of what areas, as a result are not receiving as much money or not receiving as much focus? Right. Um, yeah, I'd probably have to wait until we had our budget finalised before I could answer that accurately, Senator. Maybe could you take it on notice? Sure. Um, and I presume that these decisions 
uh, consistent with the CSIRO's overall strategy? Yes, Senator. Um, did the review process determine staffing levels for each of the various scientific and support areas of the CSIRO? Um, staffing is generally um, decided at the business unit or the ESS unit uh, level, Senator. Okay. So will, will jobs in some areas grow more than jobs in other areas? So, yeah, sorry, we're, 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 I, I'm confusing two things. So you're thinking of CSIRO as in the business units or the, or the structural units, and when we do APAIRS, we, we don't look at it by business unit, we look at it by portfolio grouping. Mm -hmm. So because of this fact that manufacturing doesn't just happen in the manufacturing BU. Now, in, in the past, CSIRO tried to structure so that all the manufacturing happened in one business unit and all the ag happened in another, but, but innovation doesn't work that way anymore, Senator. So we tend to look at the portfolio um, rather, than the, rather than the structure because if otherwise we'd be changing the structure every year to, to shift the portfolio. Yeah. Well, I'll just, I'll just focus in on the jobs thing then specifically for a bit. So will jobs be cut in any of the scientific and support areas of the CSIRO this year? I, th I think we'll probably see some shift. So, so Senator, we have a thing called interchange um, where we move people for retraining um, and then redeployment to other parts of the business. So, so I think you'll see the, the, the roughly the size of the organisation um, stay more or less the same, but you will see people shift from one part of the business to another, or maybe some people will shift will move um, to a university, and maybe other people will, will come in. But the overall size of the business will stay about the same. Okay. So, uh, is the average staffing level a factor in any proposed job reductions in the CSIRO? We're well below the ASL uh, limit, Senator. Okay. Um, and what about jobs outsourced to labour hire or contractors? Is that something that's growing within the organisation? The, the the overall size of the organisation, we have lots of mechanisms of employment in CSIRO, Senator. Um, the overall size of the organisation has grown a little bit over the five years of the strategy. Um, so it's probably a little bit bigger um, than it was at the beginning of the strategy. But the way we employ people, so you know, full-time, part-time, um, affiliates, um, there's different, we have uh, students, um, number of university professors work on our different sites and us on theirs. So there's a number of different mechanisms. If you add them all up, we're probably a little bit bigger than we were in 2015 when I, when I started. In terms of direct employees or? Well, the, the direct employee number does vary. And again, there's full-time, part-time, um, but if I count the total workforce, which is all forms of engagement, we're probably a little bit bigger than we were at the beginning. Okay. Uh, and that's because our budget's you know, bigger than it was at the beginning, and our external revenue is significantly bigger than it was at the beginning. Um, your organisation advised that the proportion of contractors as a share of staff has increased from 2.5% of staff to almost 7%. Uh, as at 29 February 2020, CSIRO had 409 contractors, 263 are engaged via labour hire agencies, which is 64% of overall contractors. Individuals engaged by labour hire agencies represent 4.8% of employees. Does the CSIRO have a strategy for reducing the number of contractors? So, Senator, it's uh, Judy Zelke. Uh, I'm Chief Operating Officer at CSIRO. Um, uh, we took similar um, questions at the previous estimates as well, Senator. Um, no, our recruitment strategies haven't changed. Um, over, the, over the last two year period or so. Um, we are moving to ensure that we um, uh, you know, have people in the right jobs and the right roles. So when we recruit, we consider whether they should be a permanent staff, a non-ongoing staff, um, should they be labour hire, etc. Noting that we have um, you know, 56 sites around the country, a number of those are regional. Um, we have things like the square kilometre array in the middle of WA. So our capabilities and skill sets that we're looking for are changing regularly. So we will actually stop and think before we, you know, go to advertise to recruit a position, what is our need in that regard? Should it be for a limited period of time or should it be for longer? Or are we just looking to backfill or fill a temporary arrangement? So we use all of those strategies in relation to all of our people. Okay. Yeah. Senator Chisholm, how, how much longer do you think you've got? Or should I, I'll, if you've got a lot to go, I'll share the uh, call. I think you... only five minutes, I think. Okay, yeah. let's try. Um, 
how many scientists engaged by labour hire agencies are under the age of 35? Uh, Senator, we have very few scientists engaged through labour hire. The majority of our people who are engaged through labour hire are more uh, in more administrative roles or in logistics or those types of activities. Um, I am happy to take that on notice um, for you, but um, it may very well be zero. Yeah, okay. Yes. Maybe if you could provide a bit of detail about who is on labour hire. Um, contracts that are between. If, um, for example, uh, if we have um, somebody coming in as a postdoc scientist, uh, we may have them on a two or a three year placement uh, because that's the length of their position. So they won't be labour hire, they'll be a non ongoing staff member uh, in that regard, as opposed to, say, a senior scientist who is a permanent officer. Um, in CSIRO, and as Dr. Marshall said, a lot of our people move uh, back to uh, back and forth between universities or other research agencies as well. Thanks. Uh, the average staffing level of the CSIRO is still around 200 lower than when Labor was in government, despite the staffing cut being lifted in the budget. Has the government provided the CSIRO with an assurance that it will increase staffing levels beyond current levels? And if so, is it expected to increase? So the, the flexibility. Sorry. I was just going to say, Senator, um, we've done a lot of uh, digital transformation in CSIRO after the la over the last five years. We've um, automated a lot of processes that we used to do manually, um, particularly in how we gather data. And, and we've shifted our scientists from doing that to actually analysing the data and getting the insights, which is kind of the real value. You know, the data is a bit of a commodity, but it's the insights that tell us what to do, you know, help us understand. Um, how to, how to um, better navigate the future. So um, that's the reason the organisation, the, the total number of people that work for CSIRO has increased slightly, um, but our output has increased um, very significantly over that time. But we're more efficient now than we were because of the use of technology. So we wouldn't have to necessarily grow our headcount in order to continue significantly growing our impact. Um, just a, a specific question uh, on 12th of March, this year, it was reported the CSIRO will spend $1.5 million on workplace health and safety measures as part of an enforceable undertaking with Comcare uh, after an explosion occurred at the CSIRO's Clayton Laboratory. I was just wondering if you could advise on the steps that are being undertaken as part of this. Yes, yeah, Senator, that was, a, that was a terrible incident involving one of our staff members who could have been really badly hurt um, working with hydrogen. And it's a, it's a really important reminder to all of us that um, w when, you're, when you have an organisation that, that works in every single industry and every single branch of science, um, the risks can be very wide and very varied. And I think it was great that we could learn from that um, and sit down with Comcare and figure out a way that we could use some of our science and technology to improve not just our safety, which has improved very significantly over the period of the strategy, um, our, our safety statistics have improved by a um, very significant factor over the last five years. But more importantly, that we could use that science and technology to help other organisations improve. So the cornerstone of that um, enforceable undertaking is an augmented reality safety system that we're creating um, with, in partnership with Comcare to help all organisations do a better job of safety, but particularly ones like ours where we do so many different things. But if you'd like some more detail on that, I'm sure, Judy, you can... Sure. Thanks. It's really exciting, Senator. Sorry. Um, uh, whilst it came out of something that was extremely serious and that we needed to, to work on, um, the work that we're doing at the moment so is to create a virtual reality uh, risk management training um, system. Uh, so you know, picture yourself putting on the hood. Um, putting yourself into a scenario where you might be in a lab or you might be uh, at one of our research facilities undertaking work and trying to use that virtual reality to actually identify risks and issues um, and be able to undertake those risk assessments prior to starting uh, an actual project in, in regard to it. So it's um, a tool that is not only going to be able to be used by CSIRO but will be able to be used by other research agencies or other any other um, uh, employer uh, that might um, see a need for this purpose. And we're quite excited about it because we get to share that um, more broadly. That being said, um, I don't doubt it will ha have a huge impact on our ability to predict and make sure that we're managing our risks appropriately. Okay. Has the CSIRO completed an assessment of the impact of the pandemic on higher education institutions? 
and how this will impact on the funding of science and research? Um, I, not that That's I'm not, not that familiar I'm with to me either. Yeah. Senator, sorry, do you have any more detail? Or? No, I was asking if you've done it. No. no, I don't believe so, Senator. Not something that concerns you or just something that hasn't been a priority? Um, or just not something we would normally do, Senator. Okay. Um, just in terms of the organisation's property footprint, uh, is the CSIO strategy remains committed to maintaining those range of locations across the country, including regional Australia? Uh, are there any sites that are closed for uh, earmarked for closure? Uh, Senator, there are a number of sites that have been earmarked for closure for quite a number of years. Um, it generally, it's quite a slow process because we like to relocate the staff, relocate the equipment, do site remediation, which in some cases can take a very long time. So it's a, it's a, it's a slow process. But Sara has had a, a strategy, a property strategy of um, site consolidation for um, almost 10 years now. Um, and has there been any any changes in that in recent period? Uh, so, um, Senator, our most recent um, uh, plan was uh, issued to uh, staff late last year. Um, so, just to put it in context, Syro has 56 sites around the country. We have a, um, a infrastructure portfolio of about 1.6 billion dollars, and we spend about 120 million dollars a year. Um, maintaining, upkeeping, refurbishing, etc., in relation to those facilities. So, um, as you can imagine, uh, with um, uptake in technology, uh, we're always wanting to try and ensure that we're putting as much of our funding into science and that technology development, rather than you know paying for keeping buildings that might not be being maximised um, in that regard. So we do have a strategy at the moment to. Um, consolidate uh, some of our sites, reduce um, those. So at the moment we're working on reducing by about 10 over say the next um, at seven or eight years, noting that a large number of those 10 actually are leased arrangements rather than uh, actual buildings. Uh, we have a number of um, arrangements though where we're looking to divest at the moment. So um, we're uh, currently moving out of our North Ride um, facility that we lease into our Linfield um, at site. We're uh, currently divesting of the Ginandera uh, site here in the ACT. Uh, we've just recently divested of the Hyatt site in Victoria. So um, we're also looking into new sites as well. So it's a, a constantly um, rolling uh, property plan in relation to the needs. Also, collaboration plays a very big part in what we do and um, working with others and, and seeing what's possible to get better outcomes and, and increased impact. Okay, uh, last couple of questions. Uh, did the Minister ask the CSIRO for any advice on sectors for investment under its manufacturing fund? And if so, what did the advice say? Um, Senator, the department asked us for advice um, and we collaborated with the department um, on that. Okay, and can you give us any sense of, of what your suggestions or focus was? So, Soro, uh, you remember you started asking about APES. So, so APES is about um, trying to understand where uh, Australian industry needs the most help or has the most opportunity. So, manufacturing is an area we know well um, for that reason. And so, a lot of the material we, we shared was the same material we used to do our own internal planning. So, sectors like, like space industry um, that we're quite excited about, um, additive manufacturing, you know, 3D printing. That's a really important area because Australia has so many unique resources and we think we can turn, for example, titanium mineral sands that are worth a few pennies per pound into titanium ink for 3D printing that could be worth tens or even hundreds of dollars per pound. So we're really interested in that type of upscaling of commodities to higher value um, materials that can be made here and the value captured and kept here. And has the CSIRO undertaken any analysis on the level of investment and funding required to deliver jobs under this national manufacturing <coughs> priorities? I, to deliver jobs specifically, mm. um, probably not so much for the, for the um, government's modern manufacturing strategy, but more for what we do, for the things we invest in our appropriation in, internally. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Oh, thank you. Um, <coughs> Senator, uh, no, we are, just point out, we are um, now a little bit behind time, so it'd be good to move this through this as quickly as we can. 
Uh, Senator Canavan, you have a couple of questions, then we'll go to Senator Roberts. Okay, I'll be very quick. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to ask a question about some research done by, I think, Dr. Simon Apti. Um, uh, there's uh, been some, it's a particular research that is around um, uh, coal dust blowing onto ship loading facilities in the reef. Um, I believe there was, there has been some reports, it might have been by Ames, I think, which purported to say that coal dust is an issue potentially travelling 100 to 1,000 kilometres from its ports. That's the Great Bay Reef. It's been included in a number of international reports. Um, uh, there's, uh, Dr Peter Reid has claimed that Dr Simon Apti and other scientists from the CSIRO showed that the results of those papers, well, that paper was out by around 3,000%. Uh, do you have any information to confirm or okay or do you, do you know what I'm talking about Dr Mayfield? Uh, Senator yes um, I am familiar with what you're talking okay. about there. Uh, so with that particular exercise um, CSIRO asked us to undertake a review of, of an academic paper that was put forward uh, and that was done by Dr Apti and in that paper it looked at the analysis of um, uh, PAHs coming from, from coal that would, would have come out of ships and what have you. Uh, and the observation was that there was uh, an error in the calculations and uh, it was about one order of magnitude, so a factor of 10 uh, different um, between what was reported and what we thought was the correct answer. And that was then given back to the author as well as the, the journal in which it was published. Right. And then there was uh, uh, a correction was, was made subsequently. So a correction has been made? My understanding is that there, was a, there was a correction published. Okay, yeah. okay. Has that worked by... Has the work by Dr Apti been published by the CSIRO or by Dr Apti separately? So, so that wasn't um, a publication. As right. Effectively, it was a report that was provided back to um, um, Gurumpa was the organisation that requested the work. Okay. And so it was a report made to them. Could you take on notice? Could we get the, the um, could you provide to the committee the information that was provided to Gurumpa? Yes, we can do that. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, and my other line of questioning, it might be different witnesses. Um, the CSIRO Gen Cost report. You're good. That's me. Okay, again. that's you as well. Easy, Dr. Mayfield. Uh, um, I, I, uh, I thank you for. There's a lot of information in this report, which is useful. Um, uh, I, I, in this report, you might be familiar that you make some assumptions around carbon prices in different scenarios. Could I ask, in the in the high VRE scenario, what was the carbon price assumed? Uh, today or whatever the first year of the model is, and and also in 2050. Um, so just just for context for the work, uh, so uh, it was done for AMO in partnership, and trying to give them understanding of technology costs both yep. today and into the future, yep. out to 2050, uh, and then looking at scenarios in, in the um, system as to how the technology mix may vary as you go forward based on those technology costs. Uh, to take it from a, a, a cost that's from today's dollars, which were done by Oricon, uh, you need to sort of apply a future scenario of how the world goes. So to do that, we applied the IEA Global uh, Energy Outlook, which has a series of generic assumptions in there that are based on their best estimates, given mm -hmm. that technology costs in the area are really driven by what happens globally, not, not necessarily in Australia, because um, most of the, the change in capacity will happen off offshore. Mm -hmm. So we applied those assumptions. I, I can't answer directly what the actual numbers were today. I'd have to take that on notice. Okay. Uh, but uh, that's the, the process that was applied um, to undertake the analysis. Yeah, so just so we're clear, I'm looking for the carbon price. Actually, I may as well get the carbon prices uh, for every year under the high VRE model, uh, or high yeah, VRE and, scenario, and I should it'll say. It'll be the published data that comes from the IA. Uh, world Energy Outlook. I think, I think you, you refer in the report to, I'm not sure if it's done by referring a report to Clark at L2014. I thought that might have been some work done uh, um, with uh, by yourselves of, and others. In terms of the parameters, it was the IEA work that's been utilised. Uh, Clark was looking okay. for something else. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll let you chase that up. Um, uh, I was just, there is a useful table at the back of the report, which has a lot of the assumptions made for different technologies. With uh, coal, with black coal, you're in this model only assuming an economic life of 30 years. Is there any reason why 
that's been chosen given that most of our existing coal-fired power stations are, are work, work, work well into their 50s mostly or around that 50-year yeah. time frame. Why, that, why that is that? So we've reported the answer. It's already started, been covered. So. Yeah, we covered okay, that earlier. Sorry. Well, I can yep. look at the hand, so that's fine. The uh, final question, this will have to be taken on notice, but did you, with the, with the um, LCOE estimates, have they been calculated in a, uh, a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet or some other more fancy model? How have they been done? Um, so with the LCOEs, and uh, we have a range of models that right. we apply. Um, so um, they look at whole of system, they also look at individual technologies, right. and plus the input data that comes from Oricon. So it's okay. actually a range of models that are applied to sort of come to the end answers. I get that, but like yeah. it, presumably there's got to be some kind of cash flow or NPV type a calculation done. Could you take on notice, can you give us the source code to that for the committee? I'd be interested in the Excel spreadsheets and or any, if you are using uh, a code code program, happy for the code as well, uh, if that could be provided. So um, as opposed to providing the code, which I think may end up being not, not answering your question, Oh, that's all right. It may be better sort of maybe to take you for a walk through the, the modelling process. I'm happy stage. to do that too, but I'm really interested in the raw, raw, raw calculations or the raw... Yep. The raw modelling, I can look at it, so yeah, that'd sure. be useful. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Roberts. Thank you, I Chair. No, you'll be your usual prompt self. Sorry. And thank you all for attending today. While your annual remuneration package, Dr Marshall, is $1,049,000 and Dr Mayfield's is $613,000, the medium income in Australia is just $49,000. Government policies based on your advice are hurting everyday Australians. So you may not feel the impact, yet 25 million Australians do feel it. For some, it is now excruciating. With your pay comes accountability. So I'm a representative and a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, and as such, it's my duty to hold agencies advising government policy accountable. Particularly agencies advising governments over the last 30 years on policies now costing billions of dollars and impacting our nation and all Australians to the extent of trillions of dollars. So I've, my questions are fairly short, each of them. In your answers to my questions in person and in writing on notice at last October's supplementary estimates hearings, you cited seven papers attempting to justify your assertion that the rate of the most recent period of temperature rise was unprecedented over the last 10,000 years. You did not specify the location of the basis of your claim, so we went through all of the papers. And we actually contacted Le Cavalier and got the data from the authors and uncovered many startling issues and questions that raise serious doubts about CSIRO's conclusions that appear unfounded at best. So detailed examination of your references reveals some startling facts. Firstly, are you aware, for example, that Kaufman 2020, which you cited, in them importing data from the Dahl Jensen borehole, they admitted the first data point, completely admitted it, and then loaded the remaining data points in the reverse time order. Are you aware of that? So, Chair, if I may, because the Senator's said a lot there in the preamble to the question, um, CSIRO exists um, to help all Australians, all 25 million. And we have done so for the 100 years of our existence, but perhaps never more so than in the last year, Senator, where we've protected citizens, COVID, we've Dr. developed Marshall. vaccines. No, no, no. Uh, you you had a very long preamble, Senator Roberts, which is unlike you, but let's just let the official respond. We've created personal protective equipment to protect frontline health workers, um, and we've helped government, both state and federal, to better understand the spread of the disease, um, its longevity on surfaces, and how to best protect our people. And, and as a result, of all of that work, Australia has come through this pandemic in remarkably good shape. Um, there are crop yields that are at record highs despite drought, despite um, other impacts of, of a variable climate. So, Senator, we are deeply concerned about the well-being of all 25 million Australians. And you, Senator, right now, um, I can bet, have at least three things on your person that were created by CSIRO Science that you, maybe you don't even know you have, um, that are, are benefiting your life. So whatever we're paid, which is decided by the REM Tribunal, not by us, um, is because everything we do is designed to benefit Australia. And like you, Senator, we want to ensure that all Australians, not just your constituents, but all Australians, 
have the lowest possible cost of energy um, and the best possible life that, that our science and technology can create for them. And believe me when I say when we do things like the GenCost report, it's all about helping industry and governments make the right decisions for the future energy mix so that we can have a lower cost of energy, so that Australian industry can have a lower cost of energy, so that we can produce more products and generate more revenue here in Australia rather than shipping raw materials overseas and buying them back at 10 times higher price. So we have the same mission, Senator, as you. So I've got a lot of information from you, but not an answer to my question. Are you aware, for example, that in your response to the Senate committee, as a result of Senate estimates, that your paper that you cited, Kaufman 2020, in importing data from the Dahl Jensen borehole, omitted the first data point altogether and loaded the remaining data points in the reverse time order. Are you aware of that? Dr Mayfield might be. I'm certainly not, Senator. But thank you. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> so, S Senator, um, you'd be aware that we've probably met on a number of occasions and we've I provided am. quite a lot of exchange of information, whether it be through this forum or through um, questions on notice or from letters that you um, provide with to us um, prior to estimates. Uh, so we've done that over quite a long period and in that time I guess our observation is that um, you don't agree with our answers. We can't change that but we also can't change our answers because um, we're very comfortable that they're based on the best scientific knowledge and scientific process. So um, you know, in the response we've given you earlier today with regard to your most recent questions which we've tabled through the, uh, through the committee, I think you know, <laughs> We, we, we will have to it's fundamentally disagree, question. is the bottom line. Are you aware, are you aware that we're, we're aware of your argument, but it doesn't change data the from conclusions the Dale Jensen that we borehole omitted the first data point altogether and loaded the remaining data points in the reverse time order. That's what yeah. you presented to the Senate as evidence. Are you aware we're, of we've that? We've also fact? presented a lot of other information to you, Senator, I'll get to that. on many occasions. And I'll get to them. The bottom line Are is you, you never agree, of and, and error. so you know we know what we believe in. We know what we understand through the scientific method. Let's move on, and Number that's two. what we will stick with. So Num we won't be we won't be moving away from answer. We Number have to two. agree to disagree. Are you aware that Kaufman 20? And I note that neither answered my question. Are you aware that Kaufman 2020 disagrees with another of your references, and that is pages 2K 2013, the reconstruction that has no uptick in recent temperatures, no uptick. Are you aware of that? We're aware of all of these claims through the various in interactions that we have with you, Senator. <laughs> We've provided our answers. Um, those, those are the answers we have. They're not going to change. Are you aware, number three, that your reference, North Report 2006, directly contradicts CSIRO's claim, your claim, that the latest temperature rise, rate of temperature rise is unprecedented? Are you aware Senator, of Senator, again, we've been through all of this. We, we can go through every single question that you make, but it's the same general response. We provided our best response. We're very comfortable with those responses and the basis of them. And we, we don't have any, well, any basis on which we would integrity. change them. And so we have to agree to disagree, bottom line. I'm happy for you to ask, answer, keep okay. asking if you really need Next to, question. but we are behind schedule. Next question, Le Cavalier, which is one of your key papers from 2017, makes a conclusion that hangs on one data point from one short ice core in contradiction of CSIRO's clear statement last October to me in writing. Now we obtained Le Cavalier's data from the authors and uncovered many startling issues. In Le Cavalier 2017, proxy data was used for recent times when more accurate thermometer data from many Arctic thermometer stations is readily available. Yet in response to our comments about Marcotte 2013, which you cited, in Senate supplementary estimates hearings last October, you said thermometer temperatures, thermometer measurements when available should be used instead of proxies. We agree. When the proxy is replaced with an amalgam of Arctic thermometer measurements, there is no period of unprecedented temperature rise in Le Cavalier that you cited. <coughs> Why? So, so again, Senator, we've been through this many times. Um, we, we've given you our in, answer. I'll go to the next one, because the Chair wants me to hurry up. In citing Marcotte 2013, how did the CSIRO overlook mentioning the author's own statement written in the paper, quote, the results suggest that at longer periods, more variability is preserved, with essentially no variability preserved at periods shorter than 300 years? 
So for periods shorter than 300 years, no variability is preserved in the data. The authors explain that variability is not preserved for periods shorter than 2,000 years. And for periods of 300 years or less in duration, no variability passes through the process that Marcotte used to analyse his data. Given the duration of the most recent, validity, most recent period of temperature rise is just 40 years, and that's Marcotte citing Mann 20, 2008 in his own paper, in the paper you cited, there is no validity to CSIRO's claim that the rate of recent temperature rise is unprecedented. All eight of your papers have, have been flawed, completely flawed. There's no evidence in your papers, not one of them. So why, are you, why are you misleading the Senate and holding us in contempt? We are not misleading the you Senate. You are, sir. We've made our responses known to you in a number of meetings, <laughs> and we've had These climate scientists facts. talk Let to you. Let me continue then. And you, you, you continue to ignore our answers, and we can't change that. This is that. why I don't accept your Senator answers. Roberts. I haven't heard the answers. I'd be interested in them, Dr Mayfield. Um, I think Senator Roberts has raised some interesting points. Um, can we all hear the answers? Senator, it might be easier just to look at the state of the climate report that we produce every two years we'll in get partnership to that with Bond. Couple of months. Yeah, we'll get to that one. Don't worry. The, the data's in there, Senator. You can see it. It's, I mean, it's not theoretical. We'll it's measured. My eighth question. You cited the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from the UN, Assessment Report 5, Working Group 1. This is an irrelevant citation as the United Nations IPCC AR5 WG1, the Working Group 1, Summary for Policymakers itself contains no reference to rates of temperature rise in the last 10,000 years. That's the, only, that's the only unprecedented change you claim to be in climate. Out of all the meetings we've had, all of the letters exchanged, that's the only one you claim is unprecedented and yet doesn't mention it at all. There is no reference even to the Holocene period or the last 10,000 years. Most citations in Working Group 1 are for only the last 1,000 years. Can CSIRO explain the inclusion of this irrelevant citation that contains no logical scientific point relevant to your claim? Can you explain why you're using that? Again, you would be familiar with three meetings that we had. We had climate scientists there who went through the arguments with you. No, it's, we've, we've been there, we've done that. <laughs> chair, Chair, can I just raise a point of order? I, I don't think it's appropriate for a, a witness to refer to private briefings they've had um, with another senator. I mean, Senator Roberts is asking for a question in this format, in this, in this, in this um, uh, framework, unless there's some public interest uh, that's being claimed here, I, I think uh, the Senator deserves an answer. So. No, well, I, th I, th I think Senator... Sorry, sorry. A lot from his answer, Matt. Thank you. So the records that of those meetings has been tabled previously. Correct. Uh, and as has um, the response to um, your various sets of questions. So there's a lot so of information that's been tabled. The fact is this has been a back and forwards that's been going on at least my whole time on the committee. I've that's got to say, Senator Roberts, I admire your perseverance, but I, I think this is very, very... I think it's getting Senator to the point here anyway. of being unproductive at a point in time where we are more than half an hour behind schedule and we have other important witnesses we want to be able to devote time to. Okay, so, I'll, Senator I'll wrap Roberts, up with two more. So, two I'll more, then two we more. really need to conclude. So, your reference, pages 2K 2013, is an irrelevant citation as it covers only the last 2,000 years. We asked for 10,000, and cannot support your claim of what you say is unprecedented over the last 10,000 years. And the second half of this question, your reference, pages 2K 2017, is an irre irrelevant citation as it covers only the last 2,000 years and cannot support your claim of what is unprecedented over the last 10,000 years. Why did you cite those two references? So again, the climate scientists <laughs> that work with CSIRO have an understanding of the science literature. They're making those references because they add to the argument. And as I said earlier, you don't agree with the answers and we can't change that. Senator, are you worried that somehow we're giving bad advice to the government about what's yes, going to be the lowest cost of energy? Definitely. Because that's what you said De in your study. And on climate policies so, which are driving the destruction so, of so our that, economy. that question has nothing to do with any of that modelling that you're talking about at all. The, the, I'm talking about the, the underpinning advice <laughs> that's driving policies on climate and energy. So, so am the I, Senator. climate advice. So am I, Senator. And it's about the cost of solar, hydrogen, nuclear, coal, gas, Stealing whatever we want to use. Rights. That's got nothing to do with climate modelling. Sector. The future that's of cost of energy is about me. the economics and the technology and the science that Let we me can make produce. It, I'm not talking just about energy. 
I'm talking about climate science that underpins the destruction of our economy, including energy, but also property rights, water resources, right across our country. That's what I'm talking about. And you're paid a million and forty-nine thousand, million dollars and forty-nine thousand a year in remuneration, and we're getting this as science. All right. It's junk. All right. Senator, Senator, Senator Roberts, Roberts, you've made your point. Sen uh, Dr. Marshall, I'm I'll let you reply, but then we are going to call it a night. Senator, it is a fact um, that CSIRO's science is in the top 1% um, of the world, in Do some cases in the top 0.1%. It is a fact, that Senator. Is it is a fact. Science. And claiming science it is a fact, Senator. Senator Roberts. Science is not science. Senator Roberts. Science is not science. You have not given Senator me Roberts. Data. Not a bit. I, I, think I will give you the data to substantiate every word I just said. OK, let's... I'll give it to you, Senator. Let's leave it there. I'll... I, uh, uh, that's it for CSIRO? Yep.